Signal is a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm your host and the Beacon's Editor-in-Chief, Cyril McAleco. Twice a month, we'll use this space to shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. We'll talk to guests who will help listeners navigate these perilous political waters by providing insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive routes. This International Women's Day, we welcome Dawn Marie Paley to the show. Dawn is an investigative journalist and author of the groundbreaking book, Drug War Capitalism. She is the editor of Ojalá, a feminist digital weekly providing reporting and analysis from Latin America. She is also a member of NACLA's editorial committee. Hi, Dawn. Welcome to The Signal. Hey, Cyril. Thanks for having me. Don, can you first tell listeners a little bit about how and why you became a journalist? Whoa, good question. Um, well, I think I was always sort of curious and curious about left politics. Um, I didn't grow up in a family where that was like the norm or my parents weren't like activists in any way. Um, so I kind of came to it pretty roundabout. Um, but I started writing like letters to the editor when I was like in high school, because my um, local newspaper in the suburb, I grew up in a suburb of Vancouver, British Columbia, was like super rabidly right wing. Like, in fact, he would be like probably considered a moderate today in like your context. But um, but he was very, very right wing for the for the times. I just remember like starting to write letters to the editor, like protesting you know, ridiculous stuff that he was saying, things that were, you know, sexist and racist and, you know, just anti-Indigenous and et cetera. And from there, it kind of escalated um, from writing letters to wanting to write articles. Eventually, I decided to go to journalism school. And I've had uh, the enormous fortune over the last 20 years of working mostly uh, in Latin America, mostly in Mexico, but also further south. And I've done a little bit of reporting um, in Canada as well, where I'm from. Why Latin America? Good question. I mean, I am also not from a family that we traveled internationally. Like I'm from a working class family and I got an opportunity through an internship when I had just come out of university, out of my bachelor's degree um, to go to South Africa on an internship and it was my first time like you know really going somewhere totally different and I learned a ton and I got to meet some people who worked in Latin America and it just seemed you know a little bit closer to home um just in terms of like distances and I've always tried to be even though I've often lived in different countries sort of stayed close to my family and it's a little bit easier to go back and forth and almost for the same reason I eventually um settled here in Mexico where you know it's the least challenging place to get to from Canada, for sure, when you think of of Latin America. So I just became fascinated with like the stories, um, the parallels, the similarities between things in Canada and, you know, in Guatemala, for example. Uh, Guatemala is really important for me because it was the place that I, you know, really uh, witnessed people for the first time being forcibly removed from their homes um, in the presence of soldiers, having their, having their um, houses lit on fire. And this was on behalf of the Canadian mining company that was in 2006. And that was really formative for me. It was the kind of thing that, you know, witnessing that and being there as a journalist and interviewing people kind of changed me forever. Like I couldn't go back to normal after that. Um, And that's kind of when I made the decision to, Uh, go back to journalism school or go back to university and study journalism and also to really commit myself to understanding what was happening in Guatemala and eventually I ended up just a little bit north in in Mexico. Friday's International Women's Day and one of the reasons why I invited you on is because I believe that your journalism and as well as your new publication that you launched last year, Ojalá, embodies the spirit, solidarity and radical aspirations of the first Women's Day which was a working class, anti-capitalist, anti-war mobilization. Can you tell listeners about why you started this publication, um, the people who are involved and what its mission is? Sure. So ojalá, it's um, a Spanish word that means hopefully. Um, And we're a bilingual publication. So we're publishing in Spanish and in English. Um, Most of our pieces and most of the journalists and, and writers we're working with are here based in Mexico or in Central America, South America. 
Um, we'd love to be working in the Caribbean as well, but we're, we're, we're building slowly and, and based on kind of our existing um, contacts as well. I'm kind of the nerd on the team that's the Anglophone with the journalism background. Um, we've got folks on our team as well, like Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar, who's a brilliant political theorist. Uh, she's been an activist her whole life, um, including, you know, having taken part in armed struggle in Bolivia in the 1990s. Uh, she was incarcerated for five years, political prisoner. So she's been through, you know, a lot of fights um, and understands a lot about social struggle. And basically the two of us, decided to found Ojalá together because from my perspective, we were missing like a critical left, definitely left progressive, but also critical uh, news outlet in English on Latin America. And on the other side, she felt like in Spanish, we're missing a critical news outlet that's also covering feminism, that's also covering this massive social movement of women and non-binary and trans people that is internationalist that also includes reporting about women's struggles maybe who don't identify as feminist and struggles in places where the left is in power Um, this is something that we've i think seen the media fall down on both in latin america and in north america where you know the left comes to power and suddenly it everyone's clapping and the criticism that our comrades are still making and the work that our comrades are still doing on the ground fails to find like a home. So we really wanted to build a space for critical reflections, of course, on the right, um, but also on the issues that surface when you have the left in power. Um, So it was probably close to two years ago we started talking about it. I mean, I had previously worked for Toward Freedom, which I know you're familiar with, Cyril, um, which was based in Vermont. And I left that publication um, because I was experiencing a lot of pressure to publish stories that were not critical of presidents and governments that people in Vermont thought were leftists. And that includes people like Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. And the list is is sort of long, but that was kind of the most egregious case where they were really upset that I published a critical reporting about Nicaragua. They thought that it should only be celebration and clapping because they legitimately believe that Daniel Ortega is a socialist. So I left Toward Freedom and I spent quite a bit of time just like trying to figure out what happened there, what was happening on the left, why why was there this why was there so much reticence to be critical? of the left in power and eventually i got sick of hearing myself complain and was like look let's make something you know i had just turned 40 so i was like this is the time in my life where i think it's it's time to give a shot at building something um and we we just started last year and we decided to put feminism in the center just because it's one of the most exciting social movements right now for sure um in the region can, can you talk, before we talk more about feminism, can, can you just tell me a little bit or explain a little bit why, um, you know, translation is so critical for your publication and, and why it's such kind of a, a radical act within journalism? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I realized through, you know, the falling out I had uh, with Toward Freedom was that I was doing my best to explain to people in Vermont who don't speak Spanish at all like why Nicaragua is not a successful socialist country. In fact, it's highly repressive. Hundreds of people were murdered by police in protests in 2018. It's a family dynasty that is controlling the country. It's totally non-democratic. And when I was looking for sources, all the sources were in Spanish. Like there was just so little in English that I finally realized like, to an extent, like that kind of ignorance is a little bit normal. It's normal that you wouldn't necessarily know, or maybe not so much now because more projects are doing translation to English now, but it would be normal for someone who only speaks English to just not be able to find that critical information about Nicaragua because there is like a cottage industry of solidarity with Nicaragua in the United States, putting out all kinds of propaganda in favor of the regime. Um, But those critical perspectives just weren't being translated. So for me, for sure, with Ojalá, like one of the things that I find so interesting about it is that 
part of, you know, the bulk of the project is really dial is, is in dialogue with and from and by folks who are active in movements or who are journalists covering different movements, right? And then the translation piece is let's make that accessible. Let's make those discussions accessible. Let's make this energy as well. Let's try to transmit that energy that we feel on the streets, for example, on March 8th or in other kinds of struggle. Let's make that available to people who are reading in English. Um, so that's kind of where the translation piece for me comes in. And I mean, it you know, you can run something through Google Translator and AI Translator, but I think it's not the same as having humans doing the work to make sure that what you're reading is accurately reflect, reflecting what's being told in Spanish. I mean, what we'd like to do with Ojalá is get folks reading and understanding that there are really exciting things happening south of the border. You know, the main focus of the U.S. media on Latin America is just exclusively migration um, and the tragedies that people are facing, why they're leaving their countries. But I think that, you know, that's one side of the story or that's one facet of the story. And it's really, really important. Um, but the other facets, like people who are organizing even in really adverse conditions and who are still bringing out thousands of people or tens or hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets to fight for a new world also deserves space in the English media that it, it just isn't really getting. And so that's what we're trying to do with, with Ojala. I mean, that's a big, that's a big goal, but um, it's kind of what we're thinking of as our little role or our grain of, of sand in the struggle, as you, as you say in Spanish. What, what are some of the feminist struggles and organizing and resistance that Ojala is shining a light on right now? I mean, March 8th is a big day. So like you said, it's International Women's Day or International Working Women's Day. It has been uh, increasingly massive protests basically since 2014, 2016. So it's definitely been gestating. And for the last number of years, it's been one of the biggest, largest protests that happens in every country where it takes place throughout the hemisphere. So it's turned into a big deal. I think the two drivers of it are basically around reproductive justice and anti-violence. Um, obviously, there's been some gains in terms of reproductive justice. You know, we know that, for example, in Argentina, women were able to push for the legalization of abortion. And that's really kind of the imagery that goes along with that is the green scarves, uh, the green uh, handkerchiefs that were used commonly in those early marches. And other places too, the right to abortion has been increasingly made available, like here in Mexico, not completely, never perfectly. It's still an ongoing process. And the other driver is anti-violence. So partner violence, but also violence in educational institutions, violence in workplaces, and state violence. And for example, in Mexico, increasingly uh, militarization as being things that are extremely harmful uh, to women, to non-binary folks, to trans folks, gender non-conforming people, um, sexual dissidences, et cetera. Um, so those are kind of the two main drivers. And there's also all kinds of protests on specific things like, you know, a woman is killed or disappeared, or there's kind of a really tragic event that happens, women will be mobilizing in the street immediately after. And then there's a handful of symbolic days throughout the year that folks also take to the street as a way to see each other. So I think that the other thing is that a lot of work that folks are doing isn't necessarily visible. It has a lot to do with care work. It has a lot to do with education. It has, a, it has to do with organizing in the workplace and unionism. Like there's all kinds of areas in the courts, in the court system, where women and gender dissidents are busy pushing for the total transformation of society or the kinds of changes that they can get, even the short term, super pragmatically, to improve the lives of people and seek justice for victims. Um, and March 8th is the day that we're in the streets and we see each other and we, we can feel the, the massivity of it in our own power. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. You've been talking about March 8th, but, you know, as, as you were just explaining, you know, the, 
feminist organizing is something that happens year round in Latin America, whether it's about tackling explicit women's issues or just kind of broader societal issues, whether it be something like anti-extractivist um, mobilizations. Could you maybe highlight you know, a few examples in Latin America, uh, a few examples of social movements that are that you've been covering over the past year? Related to feminism or? Or just, you know, I mean, women are often mm-hmm. on the front line, right? Whether like it's th- via an explicitly feminist mm-hmm. social movement or just in just more broader general social movements. Mm-hmm. So maybe just talk about some of the, the women or mm-hmm. social movements where women are kind of leading the organizing and mobilizing against some of the, these issues that we've been talking about. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's pervasive. Um, I think women, women's role and like maybe we could say women and non-cis men but the very inclusive category of, of women and, and gender dissidents, um, trans folks, non binary people, non-cis men, et cetera, um, involved in every single social struggle that has ever happened and often involved in ways that if there's a victory, for example, often the presence of women is diminished in that moment. And the people that end up speaking and the people that end up claiming the victory and the people that end up taking kind of whatever power that comes out of all that organizing, the concrete organizing, the the organizing that is feminized within movement. So this is the kind of stuff like ensuring people have places to sleep, food to eat on the front lines, that they're being cared for, that they can be there day in, day out, that their children are looked after, et cetera. All that work is feminized and is done mostly by women in these movements. And then often like that's giving it its power, that's allowing it to gain momentum or sustain momentum. And then suddenly like when, you know, when things are over, when somehow, you know, the police have backed down or the government's changed its policy, it's men up there saying like, we did great and slapping each other on the back. Um, I think historically we can see that repeated over and over again. And so, but I do think that that role of women um, in struggle is like increasingly recognized. We just put a story up last week, for example, about wildfires that happened in Chile beginning of February and how was the women as usual who just, you know, aren't asking themselves, oh my God, what do we do? This is so tragic. They just bring out the giant metal pots and they all chip in and start cooking and feeding the neighbors, feeding their own neighbors and working on that kind of like mutual aid that also is increasingly explicitly feminist. So with an eye to ensuring, again, that anti-violence, reproductive justice, things like menstrual necessities for people who menstruate, child care are thought of and looked after as well in the aftermath, in this case of an emergency. Um, All kinds of struggles, maybe not explicitly feminist, right? But like land defense, women are so often on the front lines, again, sometimes in positions that don't seem that powerful, maybe not the main speaker, sometimes we are, but often not, but doing the work that allows these extended occupations or extended struggles to continue in time. So, you know, we has stories about land defenders in Paraguay, indigenous folks who are fighting really hard to, to conserve their territory. I mean, the uprising in Chile, which had a huge component of neighborhood assemblies that were powering regular protests. This was before the pandemic. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot of examples. Another one from Mexico is the family members of the disappeared who are increasingly mobilized, doing land searches, basically just doing autonomous searches for people who've been disappeared and the state is just not looking for them or the state is criminalizing them. And that is clearly led by women, by mothers uh, specifically. And you have a long historical precedence for that. Yeah, those are maybe a couple that come to mind. I mean, also just in all different uh, indigenous land defense struggles, we've covered some of that. We were were covering some of the mobilization in Guatemala um, in the fall following the elections to ensure that the vote was respected and 
maybe you didn't see women as the main key kind of spokespeople, but the role again of helping to sustain and also strategize, do the work in the courts to try to keep the momentum going. Okay, just two more questions for you. Don, tell me about what International Women's Day looks like in Mexico. Sure. So the past couple of years, I've had the good fortune of uh, marching in Mexico City. And it's impressive. Uh, they start shutting down uh, transportation that would traverse the march route uh, about an hour, an hour and a half before. Um, and that's the Reforma Avenue, which is like the most important avenue in the city. And starting around like, say that they convene for like four o'clock, but starting around like one you have the youngest women arriving and they're arriving in, in, in organized groups of by class, like not economic class, but like they're organizing in groups by like classroom or by school and they're practicing their marches. They're, they've got their cordons, like they have their marching culture, they're very organized and they're often heading up the march. Um, so they're out there practicing, they're marching from very early on. And then just like folks are trickling in, um, Reforma shut down, this main avenue is shut down and folks are just trickling in and trickling in. And you'll see, like, I remember last year I got to, Ref to Reforma and you just see like the clouds of smoke going up and look over. It's like, oh yeah, those are the like Pachecas. Those are the women who are fighting for the legalization of marijuana. They have their own contingent. So there's all different contingents of people joining based on affinity. There's anti-militarist contingent, there's teachers, there's a small participation of like political party stuff, but it's pretty, it's pretty marginal. What's so interesting on March 8th is that you don't really see like a bunch of pre-made signs. It's like everyone has done their own sign or created their own sign with their small feminist collective and they're marching together in affinity groups. Um, the main color is purple. So that's sort of the color that's signifying feminism. And most of the messages are around anti-violence. Um, also, this is for context. Uh, Mexico City does have legal abortion that is free. So maybe that's not such a central issue as it is in places where abortion is not still accessible. So there's a lot of messages around no more deaths. There's a lot of messages around, I mean, there's messages that honestly make me cry every year, like things like I'm marching so that no more young girls have to go through what I went through. Even when we're just first gathering on Reforma, they'll do these things called tendederos. So it's like putting up like clotheslines and people will write you know, I was sexually abused by so-and-so or I was abused in my school or, and they'll, they'll like put out their denuncia, their complaint about what happened to them in a way that other people can then just come up and read it. And often they'll include the name of that person. Eventually the march starts moving. It walks from, I think this year it's from one of the main monuments uh, on Reforma called a, uh, anti-monumento de mujeres que luchan, which means the anti-monument of women in struggle. People are leaving from all along Reforma. The march starts walking and then you always have like folks like kind of with masks on, like usually like younger folks like doing graffitis or climbing up on statues, uh, that kind of thing. Like, but it's pretty chill. Like it's not like major property destruction or anything for the most part. Um, and the walk is pretty slow. It takes hours. There's so many people. Um, it's a very affirming feeling. Like, honestly, you can't see the beginning or the end of the march. And in the case of Mexico City, unfortunately, it usually passes through some very, very narrow streets before it reaches the main plaza, which is the Zocalo. And on those streets, sometimes it starts to get a little bit of ten like tension. Like, there's a pretty big police presence, and people have historically been kettled in those areas um and then once this once people are in the socalo it's you know for the most part peaceful there have been some exceptions to that but unfortunately there's often police violence um starting you know as the dusk sets in as it starts to get a little bit darker um some women throwing like uh, smoke bombs or, or releasing smoke bombs 
um, playing music, hanging out. And it's always interesting, like when the march is kind of over and then there's just like thousands of women walking home or walking to the metro or walking to the bus stop. And just this feeling of like, we keep each other safe. Um, it just is like a completely changed vibe on the streets um, after the march. I mean, during the march, it's really, really powerful. But after the march, and just around the streets downtown, you can just really feel like we're all watching out for each other. And yeah, it's a pretty amazing day. It's pretty fun. I'm really excited. You know, I think about it as like, I mean, Cyril, you know me pretty well. I'm, uh, I'm like pretty pessimistic sometimes about the world. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of us are at this point, given everything that's going on. And I'm sure there's going to be, you know, Palestine contingent this year. I think Gaza is really on top of mind for, for so many of us. But March 8th is like it for me, it's like it recharges my batteries for the whole year. I just get so I just feel the power and it's younger women, you know, like I'm in my early 40s. But the bulk of people who are marching are women under 25. And you think about how incredible it would be to be, you know, a 17 year old or an 18 year old going to your first ever protest and seeing like over 100,000 people autonomously there, their own signs, their own slogans. There's a lot of singing. There's a lot of chanting. I think it's pretty life changing for people who participate in it. And, you know, I don't want to gloss over. There's tension. You know, there's been issues with turfs in the past. Um, and last year, there was a big effort to be very proactively pro-trans. And I, my understanding is that this year, the assemblies have, have said that trans people are absolutely welcome. Um, in fact, turfs are not welcome. So that's really, really important. There's, there has been, you know, tensions around that. But it's it's a pretty beautiful day, and it's a very it's like a it's very young. It's like very very young people really leading the charge, and that feels really good in a context where a lot of things really feel pretty pretty awful. So yeah, how does that differ from your experiences of past International Women's Days? I mean, I don't even. I I was in Canada at one point on March eighth. At some point in the last six or seven years I was there in that date and I nothing happened my friends I remember were complaining that the only thing that they noticed was like shout outs on the radio and like romantic songs kind of thing like still like you know here in Mexico they will say like it's not a day to give roses to your woman friend or partner or whatever it's not like a day of celebration it's a day of struggle and like you said, it's a struggle that historically into this day is largely anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and really for the full transformation of society. Like, I think feminism in the U.S. and Canada has been captured by sort of institutional feminists. And to an extent, that was the case here as well. And the younger generations have just completely overflowed um, institutional feminism and are now on the streets demanding, you know, no less than the total transformation of society, burn it all down. Like you cannot be murdering and disappearing women and have that be like a normal thing in society, which is how the authorities would like us to be. They would like us to accept the inevitable of women being killed by their partners or women being disappeared when they're on their way home from work um, it's just a refusal to accept that as normal and to say, in fact, to change this, we don't necessarily need like little reforms. Like we need everything needs to be shaken up and turned upside down. So it's 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 pretty exciting and it's radicality as well, for sure. Um, and that's something that I don't I think is kind of lost, unfortunately, in in the context of the U.S. and Canada. Well, finally, how can people, how can listeners support your work at Ohala? Great question. This is my favorite question. Um, well, Ohala, we're tiny, right? We're, we just, we're turning one in March. And right now, the best way you can support us is by jo joining our newsletter. Um, we send out a newsletter once a week, and that updates with the main stories that we've been covering. Usually, it's just two stories a week. I think what we're trying to do is is... We're still, we're still trying to get ourselves out there just to build awareness about what's happening and build awareness about how feminists are talking about all kinds of issues and working on all kinds of issues, including 
mainstream politics, including migration, including land defense, um, including reproductive justice, like anti-prison struggles, anti-police struggles, anti-militarist struggles. So right now we are really trying to build our email list, um, you know, sharing our content online, letting your friends know about Ojala, but we're still in that very early phase of just trying to get us, get our, get our work out there. Um, if you have me back next year, I'll definitely ask for money. Um, but right now for sure, we're just trying to spread the word. So I, I think the best way to do that is, is to have folks join our email newsletter. And I'm sure you won't mind putting a link to that in the show notes. Absolutely. Don, hopefully you'll come back before next International Women's Day. But again, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for the work that you produce, um, you and your team. It's absolutely amazing. And I really encourage listeners uh, to subscribe to their newsletter. You won't be disappointed. And you're not going to find any kind of analysis like it anywhere else, at least that I know of online. Maybe NACLA, where Don is also a member of the editorial board. But Don, thanks again for coming on, and um, happy International Women's Day. Thanks. Although I don't know, I don't know, Cyril. Is that do you say Happy International Women's Day, or do you say Long Live International Women's Day? Let's say Long Live International Women's Day. Viva. This has been the Signal, a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm Cyril Michalego, editor in chief and host. For more progressive news, analysis, and opinion from Bucks County and beyond, go to www.buckscountybeacon.com.